Okie dokie. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining. Um, as the screen's prompted, we're going to be starting right now at 6.30, and I'm sure there'll be some more people trickling in. But to get started, my name is Tatiana Joseph Saunders. I'm an eco rep, and this is the plastics panel. And the way that this is going to work, we're going to have introductions of all our panelists, and then we're going to ask some questions that we've already created, and then we'll have a Q&A open for any attendees. And if you do want to have a question throughout the, if you have any questions throughout the panel, feel free to put them into the Q&A box and they'll be addressed at the end. So to start off this, the George Southern Eco Rep saw student leaders who raise awareness about ecological issues, encourage environmentally and socially responsible behavior throughout the university. And we plan events and activities to get students involved and also faculty and staff. And if you're interested in joining, feel free to email sustainability at georgiasouthern.edu for more information. So as I mentioned today, we're having a conversation about plastics with different perspectives perspectives and expertise in different spaces in the plastics world. We have three diverse panelists and each, um, rep each represent how plastics are defined within the industry, small businesses, and research. So um, that's kind of my introduction spiel. And if you are concerned about attendance verification, if you're here for a class or extra credit, you will have to stay through the Q&A session and those emails will be sent out to your professors um, tomorrow by um, Cami. And um, yeah, to start off, we're going to go to one of our panelists, John Cook. John Cook began bow recycling in January of 2019 as a response to the Bullock County ceasing its collection of plastic recyclables. Since then, John has worked to develop equipment and the methods for converting plastics and glass into useful products for landscaping and construction. Boa Recycling currently services over 250 households and businesses in Bullitt County and collects slash processes around 1,000 pounds of plastic and glass per week. The company is entering a phase of expansion in 2021 as preparations are made for a new facility, aggressive advertisement, and satellite locations. Our uh, next panelist is Dr. Lauren Matthews. Dr. Lauren Matthews is a lecturer in the biology department on the Statesboro campus. Her research focuses on coastal water quality and the influence it has on phytoplankton. She has been studying this, the Satilla estuary near Brunswick, Georgia since 2014 and began investigating microplastics there in 2018. And we will have more information on what microplastics are for anyone wondering um, in the attendees. So our last but not least panelist, Kara Pachiro. She's the Vice President of Communications and Public Affairs for the Association of Plastic Recyclers, APR. And Kara Pachiro is responsible for overseeing the implementation and promotion of technical, educational, market development, and legislative efforts and programs. She's responsible for the overall management of APR internal and external communications, media relations, conferences, and programs. So now that we know a bit more about our panelists today, I'm going to start off with Kara Pachiro asking to just give a quick rundown of the of plastics and recycling process and specifically how plastics are made for anyone who may not know all the details. Sure. So um, as some people may know already, but maybe some people don't, uh, plastics are made from crude oil. And that is quite a process to um, get that crude oil out of the ground. It, it does, although plastics are very necessary, the whole process to, um, to extract them from our planet can have quite a toll on the environment. And that's a huge part of what I do is to talk a lot about how we can reuse those plastics and recycle them. So what, uh, how the recycling process works is, is pretty basic. You take your plastics and other recyclables and you put them in your curbside recycling bin. Some people may not have curbside and there are other types of programs too. You can take them to um, drop off and um, some states also have deposit programs where you take your bottles and different things back to a store. Uh, if you want to recycle your bags and other types of wraps that go around different products, those are also store take back. Um, from there, they go to a material recovery facility, or what we call it in, in the recycling world, a MRF. And there they separate all the different materials. Uh, plastics go one way, paper, 
um, different types of metals. They all are separated at a MRF and then plastics are further sorted into different bales of types of plastics. Uh, the most common um, that many of you probably know are number one, that's called PET. Those are, um, you know, water bottles, soda bottles, and also other products like uh, uh, dish detergent and things like that. Uh, number two is called HDPE plastics. Uh, those are like laundry detergent, sometimes your shampoo, conditioner, things like that. And probably the next common one um, that most people recognize is a number five, that's polypropylene or PP. And uh, things like yogurt tubs, butter tubs, and also some shampoo and conditioner are made out of uh, number five plastics. So from there, uh, recyclers or reclaimers purchase those bales. They break them apart. They go into through a very stringent cleaning process and they take out further contaminants. They shred those, uh, the plastics down, they melt them, and then they are made into a pellet, which is then sold to uh, manufacturers, consumer brand companies to make new products. Um, sometimes there are products that are made with 100% recycled plastics, which is, you know, um, plastics that come from that process that I just talked about. Um, a lot of times there's a combo of what we in the industry refer to as virgin resin, which is what I talked about with that is made from oil. And then a lot of times there's a combo of a certain percentage of uh, new plastic or virgin resin and recycled plastic. Thank you so much for that. So as you mentioned recycling, one of the first questions we have for you is what challenges do you face when promoting recycling? And that could be promoting within any group. Sure. So. I'm sure many people are aware, again, that there are a lot of challenges with recycling. Uh, in my world, um, one of the big challenges with promoting recycling is battling negative media and misconceptions. You know, we see lots of um, articles in the news and other publications that say recycling doesn't work, recycling isn't really happening when it is. <laughs> you know, that's what I do day in and day out and the members of our organization um, are recycling plastics every day. So first of all, that's a challenge, just letting people know, yes, recycling does work. Yes, recycling is happening every day. When you put your plastics and other materials in your recycling bin, they are being recycled. Um, another challenge is simply education. Um, it, it, recycling is hard to understand. You know, what do you put in the bin? What doesn't go in the bin? You know and every community does it differently. And that leads to yet another challenge is all the programs are not standardized across the nation. Some uh, programs take some plastics, some take different plastics, some take plastics and paper, some still take glass, some don't you know, take glass and you have to take that to a, a different type of drop-off program. Um, so there are lots of challenges with promoting recycling we really, a lot of what I do is, again, combating negative media and misconceptions, uh, trying to help people understand that recycling really does work, and also helping people understand that, yes, you know, your, your products are getting recycled and, and they are getting made into new products. Thank you for that. So now we're gonna to go to Dr. Lauren Matthews. And my question for her is what are microplastics and why should people know about them? Thank you and thanks for the introduction and allowing me to be with you all on the panel today. So um, microplastics is actually kind of a new thing for me as well. I just kind of stumbled upon this area of research just in the last few years um, while doing some coastal uh, water sampling here on the Georgia coast. And what we've kind of discovered is about microplastics. I mean, just kind of starting off generally is when you hear the word microplastics, that micro part of the word obviously tells you that we're dealing with plastic uh, pieces that are very small in size. So think about a microscope, something um, a tool in research needed to see something that you really cannot see with your own naked eye. So microplastics typically by definition are uh, pieces of plastic that are smaller than five millimeters. And just for a reference, a millimeter, if you think about your fingernail, 
uh, one fingernail is about one millimeter thick. So a micro uh, plastic is something smaller than five millimeters. Um, and they come in a couple different forms. So obviously um, broken pieces of larger plastic, can, you can kind of think of like a shard or like a little broken fragment of plastic that's really small in size. We also see plastic fibers. So a lot of um, you know, synthetic clothing um, is used uh, is using kind of plastic uh, materials to do that. And so we actually get fibers, think of like plastic threads. Um, and then we also sometimes see microbeads, which are these little round spherical plastic particles. And these have been in the past used as kind of like an abrasive um, in face wash and that sort of thing. Thank you. So the next question is for John Cook. And I, it's gonna be, how do you incorporate sustainability into your business model? And can you tell us about the process of how you recycle the materials you receive via BOA recycling? Sure, Tatiana. Uh, sustainability, when it comes right down to it, really sustainability is all about the future. Uh, we're looking toward the future to see how what we are doing now with the products that we consume is going to affect the future generations. So when we talk about sustainability, what we're trying to talk about is how can we take what we're doing now and make it a small enough impact so that it doesn't continue impacting future generations. And the materials that we use right now, uh, we're making sure that we're using all of our resources wisely so that we're not simply wasting something simply because we no longer have a need for it. Uh, at Burr Recycling, we are trying to develop products that have a very long use life. And we have developed a process where we can take uh, all plastics and use them to create a material that can be used in basically construction or the landscaping industries, uh, different places like that. We want to take a product and use the, the mechanical and the physical properties of plastic, which are amazing, and turn them into a useful product that can be used back in our society to to build what we live in, to help build infrastructure that we use in a way that is going to uh, last for decades, uh, if not generations. Uh, one of the problems that we see in the plastics recycling industry is that oftentimes uh, when we do recycle a bottle or if we do uh, recycle different materials, oftentimes they still wind up in a landfill or some other misused fashion uh, in just a very short amount of time. So what we're trying to do is figure out how to take that plastic that we have and use it for something that is actually beneficial to society and that's going to last a very long time. Thank you. Just a reminder to all the attendees that if you do have any questions, feel free to put them into the chat. And so for our next question, we'll go back to Kara. And we're going to be talking about the, the extended producer responsibility. And do you support the extended producer, producer responsibility? And if so, how should it be included in the recycling process? But also, we recognize that there's no like one definition. So feel free to elaborate on that. And um, Sure. Um, so uh, we've heard a lot about extended producer responsibility over, over the years in the recycling world, and uh, or we call it EPR. And basically what that is, is making the producer of products responsible for taking care of them on the back end. So that just as a simple example, um, a company like Procter & Gamble that makes laundry detergent, they would somehow help and be responsible for taking care of that laundry detergent on the back end for the recycling process. So as you can imagine, there is no one definition for EPR. Being responsible for that product can take many, many forms. Um, of course, we support EPR. Um, we, my organization, uh, we have a lot of position statements that we come out with where we take a formal position on legislation or things like EPR. 
We don't have a formal position quite yet on EPR just because there is no exact definition of EPR. Um, one thing that we do have a position on that could be considered a major component of EPR is something called mandated recycled content. So that means that companies are required by law to include a certain percentage of recycled plastics or other materials in their products. We just saw, uh, which we are very excited about, my organization was quite involved with getting this legislation passed in California. It's the first bill of its kind in the United States where re uh, recycled content will be required in plastic bottles. Um, uh, the bill was just passed and it, it will take what we call a ladder effect. So a certain percentage will be required by 2025 and then they will up that percentage by 2030 and then up it again by 2035. And the reason they do this is to make sure that there's enough supply. If this is something that's required by law, everything else will fall into place. Uh, California is a bellwether state, so we often see other states kind of fall into line. So already New Jersey is working on a recycled content bill. They had already um, kind of sent it in to get approved um, by the governor, but they took it back for review after the California bill was passed so that they could mirror that bill. Um, so that's one form of EPR, which of course we support. And we think that mandated recycled content is um, a huge step in the recycling uh, industry and we support all of this on a state level and it's also included in some uh, bills that have been introduced on a federal level as well. Thank you and so yes more legislation you be will help improve the recycling process for like all facets. C could you say that again you cut out I on saw, me just for a second. Oh sorry I, I was just like agreeing with you and just con that um, more legislation would help the recycling process, not just on the industry side, but individuals, business side too. Absolutely. Um, recycling has largely been kind of a state and local issue over the years, uh, but we've been really excited in my organization to be working on three different bills that have been introduced on a federal level, um, which would really do a lot to improve recycling. Thank you for that. Thank mm -hmm. you. So for the next question, we can go to um, Lauren. And I was just, we were just curious about how do you determine the toxicity of microplastics after we just had a uh, like definition and kind of explanation of those. Can we talk about the toxicity of them? Yeah, so I think a good place to start is really to first, you know, talk about what, what do we mean by something that's toxic, right? So obviously the word toxic kind of already has a, a negative connotation. So we're suggesting that microplastics have a negative effect on organisms or on the ecosystems in which they're found. Um, and what's interesting about that is it really depends on the system and it really depends on a species. So every single organism that is exposed to microplastics uh, could be affected in a different way. So for example, you know, we have found microplastics um, in tissues in, in birds and in uh, oysters and some fish, uh, but we've also seen them in really small organisms such as plankton. Um, so really in, when it comes to toxicity or when it comes to impact, you really kind of have to first think about uh, what organism or what uh, species of interest you have in mind. Um, but another reason that we need to think about toxicity has to do with the fact that these pieces of plastic, these very small microscopic pieces of plastic, even though they might seem uh, so small that they're not a big deal, they actually can be carriers of um, other types of toxins that may be in the water. So for example, if there is um, you know, chemicals in the water or metals in the water, those things can actually uh, bind to and attach to these little pieces of plastic and therefore be transported throughout a system and then obviously can be taken up by organ an organism that um, you know, takes it in as food. Uh, so when it comes to determining the toxicity, it, it really comes down to one, uh, identifying if toxins are actually present um, and thinking about what you mean by that uh, word toxin. And then obviously focusing your research on 
uh, perhaps a certain uh, species that you want to examine that, or if you just want to see if they are present uh, in the water, you know, just in general, with not really thinking about an organism that might be affected by it. Thank you. So our next question is going to be for John. And how has the general public been engaged with your business with less participation and an increase or decrease given the pandemic? And what plans do you have to improve engagement? Uh, the public has been very supportive of what we are trying to do here in Statesboro. Um, however, it is a small percentage of the public who who is um, actually actively involved in recycling. Um, what we're trying to do though, is we're trying to get the cost of the services that we provide low enough uh, to make it more feasible for more of the public to use our service. Uh, most people we talk to um, understand the need for recycling and believe that it could be beneficial. So our task right now is to get our procedures uh, effective enough and efficient enough that we can lower the cost to be able to offer recycling to more people on a regular basis. And in between now and then, until we're able to do that, we do have uh, events that we have periodically where we try to encourage the community to just bring their recycling to uh, an event location and drop it off for free. Um, we try to help uh, every time a school is interested in recycling, we go above and beyond to try and do everything we can to help them with the discounted rates um, so that they can really start teaching this next generation of children the importance of recycling because it is the generation that's in school right now are the ones who are actually going to make the differences that we really need to see in the future. Uh, so we want to see what we can, what we can do to educate uh, as many of those, uh, uh, everything from elementary age up to college age students as possible, and to be able to impact the community in a way where we can offer this uh, service at a cost low enough uh, to really be able to engage more of the community. Thank you. I think that working on edu well, focusing on education within the community, no matter the age, is really helpful for like all facets of sustainability. So yeah. So our next question is for Kara. And what is the biggest challenge of decreasing contamination in cities and communities? Since we talked about challenges with recycling, kind of looking at a more communal city perspective. Sure. Uh, well, first of all, I think that's another thing about recycling that there are probably some misconceptions of what what does contamination actually mean? So there are there there are kind of different um, meanings for it. So of course, one form of contamination that um, uh, people in the community can help with is, you know, don't put wet things in your recycling. Don't put extremely dirty, you know, that are covered in food and um, things like that in your recycling. It's good to kind of make sure things are dry and clean when you put them in there. On the plastic side, I mean, it goes through such a stringent cleaning process at the recycler or reclaimer. That doesn't make a huge difference, but if you put those types of things in your recycling bin, uh, most programs now are single stream, which means you throw all your recyclables together in one bin. So if you put something that's wet or you know contaminated with food, it can really have a huge effect on things that are paper or cardboard and things like that. Um, another um, type of contamination is just when the wrong thing goes in the bin. So as I mentioned earlier, um, once your recyclables go to that material recovery facility or the MIRTH, they are sorted into different types of materials and the plastics are further sorted into different plastic types. So if a type of plastic, um, you know, it's supposed to be a number one PET bale, which is water bottles and soda bottles mostly. But if other things go in there too, that's a type of contamination. 
And then um, a huge type of contamination that a lot of people really aren't aware of is package design. And this is a lot of what I work on at APR. We have a design guide for recyclability and this is for manufacturers and consumer brand companies. It's a series of guidelines that really let them know how they can design their packaging so that it is truly recyclable because all kinds of design features can affect how something is recycled. If they put um, certain types of labels on a package, that can affect recyclability. It can affect it in all kinds of ways. Let's say if the label covers the entire bottle, um, it might not be able to then be identified as what type of plastic it is, and then it won't go in the right bale when it's being sorted. Um, let's say you have a plastic bottle with a metal cap on it, and those metal caps often have a little ring underneath them. When those go to the recycler or the reclaimer, that metal can cause all kinds of problems in the recycling process too. So there are really, you know, there are three types of contamination, like I mentioned. Really, what the consumer can affect is you know, put clean and dry things in your recycling. And then there's what happens at the MRF. We need to work to make sure the right things go in the right bale. And then consumers and manufacturers, they need to design their packaging so that it doesn't contaminate the recycling stream with things like labels, um, inks, uh, metal components, and things like that. Thank you. And yes, I agree. It does need to be consideration on both sides when it comes to so recycling. And Absolutely. so, <laughs> yes, the next question I have is for Lauren. And given the current state of the world with the increase in plastics, whether those are masks, gloves, or anything else, plastic use and single use plastic given COVID-19, what steps are being taken to prevent these items from becoming future microplastic pollution in the ocean? Okay, thank you. So, um, I guess there is a lot of concern. Uh, we have probably all experienced going to the grocery store, or going to Walmart, or going to a restaurant, and you know you park your car and you get out and you look at the ground, and there is uh, plastic uh, debris specifically related to the COVID nineteen uh, pandemic. So maybe someone who parked in that spot before you took off their gloves when they came out of the grocery store and instead of you know taking them and throwing them away at their home or in the um, you know trash can in the um, parking lot they just dropped it on the ground we also see the same thing like you mentioned with masks um, and so there is a kind of a growing concern of people not taking responsibility for their plastic waste related to uh, the pandemic um, and unfortunately I think this is going to be a continued issue uh, of course in the weeks and months to come as we kind of see what happens with the virus and whether or not um, kind of our state of existence uh, changes and stabilizes. Um, but in terms of things that are being done, um, I really haven't heard of much of a kind of uh, you know, local or state or federal effort. I mean, obviously our biggest challenge, which has already been mentioned by the other two panelists is just awareness and education. So drawing attention to the fact that we each are personally responsible for um, our, our trash and things that should be properly disposed of. Um, you know, it ultimately just comes down to, to letting people know what the, the downstream effect of that is. So from the standpoint of microplastics, um, again, a glove is not a microplastic, but if that glove doesn't get properly disposed of and, um, you know, we get a rainstorm and that glove ends up in the, uh, you know, sewer system and that sewer system dumps into a creek and that creek runs into a river and then that river ultimately reaches um, our oceans, then over time, um, and with exposure to um, physical forces and chemical forces and even um, you know energy sources like light, that plastic can be broken down. And ultimately, over a period of time, we could obviously be producing or inputting additional microplastics into our natural ecosystems. So um, I don't think we're quite yet, there yet. I don't think we've actually seen, to my knowledge, microplastics produced directly related to COVID because the process does take time 
to break those larger plastics down. But I definitely think this is something that we need to, again, be aware of, take some personal responsibility for, and obviously kind of watch and see um, what comes out in research and um, things that we're noticing is going on in our ecosystems. Thank you. So this next question is for John. And in what ways do, what ways do world recycling try to encourage the community to recycle more since most plastics end up in a landfill, even plastics that have been recycled? I know that you did mention that there are events where people can just drop off the recycling without any fee. And you can elaborate on that more if there's or if there's other ways. Um, we would love to hear it. Well, that's uh, what we're trying to investigate right now. Uh, because we have been, uh, and technically we still are in the research and development phase of our process and our uh, business model even, uh, we can't aggressively go after community, uh, uh, community involvement with recycling. Uh, so what we're trying to do right now is just uh, slowly do one thing at a time as we're trying to build up that, that community involvement um, while at the same time being responsible and being able to handle the extra material that we get in. Uh, during the COVID crisis of this year, uh, we, we really weren't sure what we were going to see um, in response uh, to people uh, being uh, uh, shelter in place, uh, people having issues uh, with with jobs, finances, such as that. But uh, we were surprised to actually see our numbers, our involvement grow uh, during that. Uh, it seems as though when people are stuck at home 24-7, uh, they tend to use a bit more plastic at home. Um, and we only saw just a few people have to drop off because of financial situations. They weren't able to maintain the service. But even then, uh, we gave uh, you know several of our customers uh, a grace period where they could use our service free of charge uh, for several months. Uh, but we are working with uh, some local businesses uh, to try and just uh, get the word out right now, basically, that recycling is an option in our community. There's still a lot of people who are unaware that we even exist and what we're capable of doing. Uh, so it all comes down to really education, just uh, getting that information out there to everyone. Thank you. And those are actually all of our questions that will be chose. And now we're going to be getting started on the questions that people have put in the chat. And John, the first one is for you. So this came from one of the attendees. And it says... What does World Recycling do with the materials collected? So I think it was when you were mentioning about um, the goals of World Recycling and getting the community involved. I think that's when this question first popped up. So the could you repeat the question? I'm sorry. Yeah, it's, so the question was just, what does World Recycling do with the materials collected that they've gotten sure. from people? Uh, well, we collect, um, as a part of our service, we accept uh, all plastics, all glass items, um, all metal items. We don't accept paper and cardboard. We don't accept paper and cardboard because it's too uh, bulky and we just don't have the capabilities of, of processing it. We actually don't have a vendor to get that paper and cardboard to at the moment. Um, the metal, we take all the metal food cans and drink cans and all and we get them to a local metals uh, recycling company, a vendor, who then sends it off. Uh, to be recycled. We keep all of the plastic and all of the glass that we collect uh, to use in the process of making the product that we use. So we process all of the plastic, all of the glass in-house, and it's all used in making our products. Thank you. I'm sure that person appreciated that. And we have someone in the chat that was asking that kind of missed the introduction before for all the panelists and I'll be happy to go over that one more time. So we have three panelists here today as you 
you can see. And one of them is Kayla Pacheco. She's the Vice President of Communications and Public Affairs for the Association of Plastic Recyclers, APR. And no, that was also a question in the chat. And Kayla Pacheco is responsible for overseeing the implementation and promotion of technical, educational, market development, and legislative efforts and programs. She is responsible for the overall management of APR internal and external communications, media relations, conferences, and programs. Our next panelist we have is Dr. Lauren Matthews. The, the lecturer in the biology department here on the Statesboro campus of Georgia Southern. And her research focuses on coastal water quality and the influence it has on phytoplankton. She has been studying at the Satya SUA near Brunswick, Georgia since 2014 and began investigating microplastics there in 2018. And we've just heard from John Cook, our third panelist, who began bow recycling in January of 2019 as a response to the Bullock County ceasing its collection of plastic recyclables. Since then, John has worked to develop the equipment and methods for converting plastics and glass into useful products for landscaping and construction. Bow Recycling currently services over 250 households and businesses in Bullock County and collects such processes, a thousand pounds of plastic and glass per week. The company is entering a phase of expansion in 2021 as preparations are made for a new facility, aggressive advertisement, and satellite locations. So I see we have a few more questions that have popped up. And this one is for Kara and John, Well, the next two are for Kara and John, so for free to and so whichever one. What does the ideal standardization of recycling look like to you? So you want me to go first, John? Go ahead, Carol. <laughs> okay, sure. Um, well, of course, we'd like to see uh, a standardization among the programs across the country of what they collect and um, education and everything so that ev you know, no matter where you go, you can recycle the same things. That's a huge ask because there are all, you know, there are such huge differences across the country in uh, material recovery facilities, the MRFs, like I mentioned, uh, an, an investment in, in recycling infrastructure is so necessary right now. And that's something that um, our organization has really been working on, on a national level to try to pass some federal policy that would um, supply some funds for that infrastructure. So of course that would be great. That's a huge ask, um, uh, but something that we work on every day and we work with other, a lot of other organizations on that too, including one called the Recycling Partnership, which is a great organization that I encourage everybody to check out, um, check out their website. And then on another level, something that I work on um, all the time at APR is uh, design for recyclability. I mentioned that in contamination, how design can have such a huge effect on recycling. Products need to be designed so that they can successfully make it through the current recycling infrastructure. Uh, we, we provide training programs to consumer brand companies and manufacturers um, to let them know like this is what you need to do to design your products so they'll be recyclable. So of course we would love to see that type of standardization as well so that all products are recyclable are designed so that they can be recycled. Uh, I agree with Kara completely. One of the biggest issues we encounter are those products that aren't designed well. Um, right. Something as simple as uh, one we see often are the containers that tennis balls come in. Mm -hmm. um, it's a clear plastic container, but it has a metal ring around the lid and certain uh, microwavable food containers also are made out of plastic and they have a metal ring around the lid. and you actually have to, it, it takes a lot of work to separate uh, those items out. Um, so uh, that standardization of packaging would, would be amazing, um, but it's also gonna take a, a bit of a cultural pushback because uh, we're living in a culture that that is so used to simply throwing away what it uses and so used to have everything packaged individually um, we, we've got to figure out a way of, of getting a, a cultural pushback from that where everything is not just simply sing, single use plastics, um, where, where we're, we're becoming, uh, we're creating packaging, we're creating things that can be reused. Um, and again, the things that we do make out of plastics uh, so that they're, they're recyclable uh, much easier. 
thank you. And then the next question we have for you too is can you guys talk about the supply and demand of the recycling market? And I think John may have mentioned this when he was talking about just what you can imply from the engagement from the community and when Carol was talking about the legislation, but feel free to do anything you want with that question. I'll add, um, there's there's something that, that we're seeing in the country that has really taken off over the last two years. It's the collapse of recycling for smaller communities um, and the kind of constriction of what larger communities, larger programs are able to recycle. Um, if you live in a larger municipality that has more resources, it's easier to find places to do recycling, but many regions, uh, many, many of the smaller locations, the communities like Statesboro just simply do not have the resources to offer the recycling uh, to its citizens. I'm glad that you mentioned that, John, and it, it's so important when we talk about supply and demand. That's a concept that we often hear with businesses and recycling is a business. This is what many people just don't understand. They say, oh, well, that's a community service that should be supplied to me for free. But that's not always the case. It's, it, it's a business. There needs to be supply. There needs to be demand for that supply. I do a lot of work at APR to really boost the demand for recycled plastics. If consumer brand companies and manufacturers will commit to purchase recycled plastics to put into their products, everything will fall into place. If the recyclers can feel confident that they have a market for that product that they are creating, they can invest in their process. They can invest in their business. Right now, recycling is largely a spot market, meaning there are, it is very uncommon for long-term contracts and recycling. Every month, the recyclers are saying, well, okay, who am I gonna sell my, um, my pellets to this month? They maybe will commit to three months and then they try to compare it to the cost of how much it will cost to buy new plastic rather than recycled plastic. And there's always that comparison, but what we're always trying to, to really push the message at APR is recycled plastic is essential to a circular economy, which is, which is something that we're always hearing about in the industry. It's just about, you know, products staying in um, in the process rather than going in a landfill. You recycle, they're used again, and then they're put in new products. So and if we, oh, go ahead, John. I was just gonna say really to piggyback off of that, what, what Kara says is true. It, it really all comes down to, to profit and to cost. Um, mm -hmm. These communities, simply plastic is just not worth anything to a community. They can't find anyone to sell their plastics to that they collect. Um, or if they do, they're taking a loss on it and there's just no market for it. So unless we could find a way of making recycling more profitable uh, for businesses and even municipalities to be able to justify in the, the cost of the investments, uh, it's, it's gonna be difficult to, to climb this hill. Right. And that's why we always say uh, demand is key in long term contracts. So that um, will go right down the system. If a consumer brand company signs a long term contract with a recycler, they feel confident that they're going to have that market for a certain period of time. So then they will pay more to that community or the material recover recovery facility for those plastics that are bailed up. They say, OK, we can afford it. We know we have this market for a certain amount of time. But there's always this back and forth if that market is uncertain. So supply and demand is so important to recycling. And right now, we're really trying to do a lot to boost um, the supply, meaning what is put into the recycling process. A lot of the recyclers in the United States, actually the vast majority of them, they can process a lot more material than they currently are. They are not operating at capacity, but they simply can't get their hands on that material. Thank you both. Really great, great. Um, two questions are for Lauren. And the first one is, how do you personally reduce your impact via microplastics? So I think they're implying how, how would they reduce the impact? How does the everyday person? Yeah, so I don't think most people wake up in the morning and say, how can I uh, help with microplastics? I think 
the bigger kind of goal here, which has already been mentioned repeatedly by our other panelists, is just plastics in general. So the reason we have microplastics typically is because they're broken down fragments of larger plastics. So, you know, again, taking personal responsibility for, for example, recycling, which we've <laughs> obviously gotten that very good take home point today. Um, if we can uh, lower the amount of plastics that um, are not uh, handled properly. So things that are either, um, you know, ending up in our environments, ending up in our, uh, you know, waterways, those ultimately can be broken down and make microplastics. Um, so yeah, you kind of have to think bigger. Think about, uh, again, not buying water bottles, using a, a recyclable, refillable uh, water bottle, because ultimately that water bottle could become microplastics one day. So um, I would say most often, most people starting with something as simple as recycling is a really good effort. Um, what I've seen in, in my research is we're actually seeing a lot of fibers. So these are pieces of uh, plastics that, again, as I mentioned at the beginning, are coming from synthetic clothing. So much of our clothing that we wear, and I, I would encourage all of us, myself included, to check um, your clothing tags. I mean, unless you're wearing 100%, um, you know, natural cotton uh, or, you know, bamboo fibers, most everything of what we wear on our bodies has some synthetic fibers, which obviously contain plastics. So um, what's interesting and what is, I guess, a little bit discouraging is every time you wash your clothes, that physical, you know, um, rubbing of the water and the clothes up against each other, you're actually releasing those fibers um, from your clothing. And obviously when the washing machine drains, those plastic fibers are going down the drain with the water. Um, that water either goes into your septic tank or goes to a public um, wastewater treatment facility. Um, and it's pretty hard to filter out really, really small pieces of plastic at a wastewater treatment facility. There are some facilities that do it, um, but as you can imagine, it's expensive and it's another kind of layer of water treatment that not all uh, facilities uh, focus on. So um, I think it's kind of in the grand scheme of things, how far do you want to go? <laughs> uh, little things, little steps uh, matter, but obviously you can take it as far as, as wearing all natural clothing, not using any single use plastics. Um, and it, it kind of really is up to us to take the level of personal responsibility that we want to. Thank you. And the next question, if you kind of touched on it when you were talking about your research and how you that led to you finding fibers. And this question is, what's your research in microplastics and what have you found? So I guess it's a general overview or uh, anything. Yeah. Yeah. So um, really, my research focus is more in just general coastal water quality. So, um, you know, my background and training is looking at, you know, physical um, and chemical uh, and biological interactions in our coastline. So estuaries are, um, you know, natural ecosystems along the coast where freshwater meets saltwater. Um, and so that's the, the system that I most um, spend most of my time in, I guess you could say. Um, and I'm really, for a long time, have been interested in things like plankton. So plankton are very small organisms. They're at the base of the food web. Um, and most people don't think anything about them, maybe don't even know that they're there. Um, and so what's been interesting is when we've been collecting samples and looking under the microscope at some of these microscopic organisms, that is actually when we saw plastics in the water. So again, they're very small pieces. They often look under uh, a microscope just like a cell or just like a piece of an organism. Um, but obviously they, they do have some different properties. They're plastic and not uh, organic. Um, matter, not cells. So I guess ultimately our research has been one, just documenting that microplastics are there. Um, and now this has kind of become a, a bigger initiative, um, not only in Georgia along the coastline, but in a lot of states and around the world. It's just actually getting out there and looking to see if plastics are there. And then obviously as part of that, trying to think about the impact, starting to study if it's going to negatively affect an organism or if 
they're there and we just need to figure out if they're a problem or not, so. Thank you. Thank you. So sure, they appreciate that one down. So this next question is for John, and it is, what has been the most common material dropped off, and are there any items that stand out as things that don't have you made of plastic and just seem wasteful to buy? Um, you you cut out there at the at the very end of the question. Oh, okay, yeah. So so the first one was just what has been the most common material dropped off at bow recycling, and the second one is are there any items that stand out as things that don't have to be made of plastic but just seem wasteful to buy that may contribute to an over another problem with sustainability? Um, our our most common item we find. Um, what we do is we take care of recycling that comes from households. So if anything is in a home, that, that's what we get. So we see a lot of water bottles, detergent bottles, food containers, grocery bags, uh, things like that. Um, the thing, gosh, I'm trying to think of something that would be a good example of an item that people throw throw away. One does not come to mind right off, but if I think of something, I'll chime back in and give you my input on that. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sure they appreciate it at any point. Um, so this is kind of, it seems like a question for like anyone. So when one attendee mentioned how their main interest is in the process of bioremediation, and they were curious if anyone on the panel has done any research with this process or anything about it. So I'm not sure uh, bioremediation if they mean um, bioplastics or biodegradable plastics. I, I'm not quite sure. Um, there was Ashley, no clarification. Have... <laughs> There's okay. no clarification. It was just they just mentioned that as the main interest. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, I can quickly comment on those two things, and then Ashley, you probably have more than I would say. Um, we've done a lot of work with big consumer brand companies like Coke, whom you may have heard the, of the plant bottle, um, and that's where they have developed a, um, a type of plastic that is completely bio-based and it is completely compatible with other types of plastics, which are great. So um, we definitely encourage that. We think that's great. Um, biodegradable plastics, there are a lot of misconceptions about those. I, I often talk about misconceptions when I'm talking about recycling. Um, a lot of times people think that a product can be both biodegradable and recyclable, and that is not true. If something is made with a biodegradable plastic, do not put that in your recycling bin. It should It, it is not compatible with the recycling stream and the most uh, easy example I can sh uh, share with why that doesn't work is let's say you put a biodegradable plastic um, that gets mixed in with other PET bottles and then those PET bottles are then uh, reprocessed and made into strapping that is holding uh, lumber on a truck going down the highway at 75 miles per hour. And then that plastic might start to biodegrade in the sun and that is a, not a strong product holding that wood on that truck and it can fall off the truck and we all know what could happen there. So sure, um, biodegradable plastics, you hear a lot about those, but I just always, always try to let people know, no, it is not possible to be both biodegradable and recyclable. Um, you will see labeling sometimes that says it is both. That is not true. We have worked on a lot of legislation that has been passed in several states that makes it illegal to put that on your label. A lot of the biodegradable companies try to push that and say, sure it is, sure it's recyclable, but it's not, and it can be very dangerous. So I can uh, just add on to that with a little bit more information about uh, bioremediation. So typically um, we think of bioremediation as um, using biological organisms. So thinking of a species, thinking of an organism, um, that can be used to remediate or to solve ecological problems. So there's a lot of examples. Um, you can think of organisms that can, you know, filter air or can uh, filter water. And so uh, in terms of my area of research, um, I know that there has been some efforts to um, investigate different species that might be able to break down plastics. 
Um, so for example, if you kind of think about organisms that have the ability to break down food, like think of a, a fungus. So fungi are known for being decomposers. Uh, so, you know, perhaps if we can uh, find and investigate a type of fungus that when put into, for example, or working in conjunction with a wastewater treatment facility, uh, maybe that fungus can actually help break down some of those plastics that are not being captured by the, um, you know, the filtration system. Um, bacteria also have a pretty strong history of being used uh, to break down kind of human problems. Uh, a, a very common example of this is when we had the really big Deepwater Horizon oil spill. Um, there was a lot of research out there about how bacteria naturally occurring in the oceans were actually helping with the breakdown of the oil. So um, I definitely think it's an area of research of being explored. It's not something that I personally have looked into um, other than just knowing that it's out there and it's definitely um, a really cool idea that hopefully we'll be able to push forward with in the future. Thank you both for that. So this next question, um, we talked about the supply and demand of recycling and getting the public to be more like excited and willing. But this question is asking about how do you increase the demand for recycled products? So kind of after they've already been through the process, like let's say at bowl recycling or something else, if anyone would like to take this question, how do you increase the demand for recycled products within communities? Um, sure, I can answer that, answer that with, a, with a couple things. Um, uh, one huge um, uh, message that we push out at APR is to buy recycled. And when I say buy recycled, you know, we say recycling doesn't end in the bin. Sure, you're recycling when you put your, um, your bottle in the bin to be recycled, but it's also important to buy products that are made with recycled plastics and other materials. So if those brand companies see like, okay, our consumers are really interested, they want to buy products made with recycled plastics and other materials. And we have seen with all kinds of national surveys that people really, you know, they wanna help the environment. They wanna buy products that are made with recycled materials. So that's one thing that anybody can do simply buy products that are made with recycled plastic. Look for those labels that say made with post-consumer content or made with recycled material, made with recycled content. And then on the other end of the spectrum, we have all kinds of programs to try to boost demand on that um, consumer brand level. We have one um, big campaign at APR, it's called the Recycling Demand Champions Campaign. And it's very simple. Companies sign a commitment that they will buy more uh, recycled material in the coming year. And, it, and, it, and it's a year long commitment. We've had many that have signed it for year after year after year. They just have to increase the amount of recycled plastic that they purchase. And they can do this in a few different ways. They can do it where they manufacture a product that's made with recycled plastic. And let's say they already manufactured that product before their commitment. All they have to do is sign the commitment and then they increase how much recycled plastic is in there. Another one is they come up with some sort of new innovation or product that is made with recycled plastics, brand new. So that's again, more material, more demand for material. And then an even simpler way, they can, they can sign the commitment and buy products for their actual facilities that are made with recycled plastics, like bags, um, all kinds of things that are made with recycled plastics, pallets, bins, um, all kinds of things that can go in a manufacturing facility or even an office or anything like that. Um, there's a huge amount of material that is purchased for manufacturing and offices every year. And if they simply commit to buy those that are made with recycled material, it boosts demand. Thank you. I think we have time for these two questions. So just keep that in mind when I want to answer them. Um, so this next one is for John. And do you see an opportunity to scale up what you are doing to, do you see an opportunity to scale um, what you're doing at Bowl Recycling to make it more widespread beyond the local state sport community? Yes, that's actually the goal of what we are trying to do. Um, we're trying to create and well what we have done is created a, a business model that works on a relatively small scale 
um, you mentioned in the in the bio when you were introducing me and the company that we're collecting a little over a thousand pounds per week. That's a that's a tiny 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 amount of plastic. Um, some of these larger municipalities are collecting tens of tons of, of plastics and all per week. Uh, so that's not really our focus. Our focus is gonna be on these smaller communities and even certain organizations that want to recycle. We've created a process that's simple enough and efficient enough that anyone can do it uh, basically anywhere. Uh, so we're actually beginning to talk to a couple of other communities here in Georgia where we're hoping to uh, do a satellite location uh, beginning next year and uh, then begin branching out um, into these other communities across the country that that simply don't have access to any recycling whatsoever. Thank you. Mr. McCammon's on. Thank you. So this next question, it's pretty broad. So once again, feel free to anyone to take it. Um, what is the future of plastic? And are there any viable materials for, that are biodegradable or environmentally friendly that are close for close to being ready for mass utilization? So those are two very like different questions. And so one panelist wants to talk about the future of plastic, and another wants to talk about um, mass utilization of certain materials, feel free to. But I think that will be the last question of the panel. Well, I, I will say that if you look at all of the studies, all of the reports that plastic is not going away anytime soon, the production of new plastics, it's actually increasing at a very rapid rate. And depending on what study you look at, uh, some indicate that it could go up as high as uh, at least four times the amount by the year 2050 in the United States. So we have to begin looking at how to kind of rein in those numbers um, and what to do with not only the plastic we're gonna produce in between now and then, but what to do with the plastic that we already have produced that we're beginning to you know, try and pull out of our environment and eventually um, do some reclamation products uh, where we're actually taking the plastic waste that we've produced uh, in the past and, and reclaim it into, into a usable product. I would agree, um, you know, plastics are not going away. I mean, they're, they're essential in all kinds of ways. They provide a lot of benefits, um, you know, to society. I mean, packaging is necessary in many ways, but um, so at APR, we like to think the future of plastic is recycling. We need to make sure that products are designed so that they can be recycled. And we need to work on recycling infrastructure and education so that we improve our in infrastructure so that those programs can be standardized across the nation. Everybody learns the same thing in every community. Everything is taken, you know, the same types of products are taken in those communities. Um, so that's what we really hope, you know, to see as the future of recycling. If we, if we can just make sure that those products are recycled, so many problems can be solved with plastics. And, and I will say we, we do need to, um, while be, we're, we're optimistic about uh, certain products that are being developed, the biodegradable plastics and all, we have to understand that those are going to come at a cost as well. Um, some of those we recognize now, um, some of the biodegradables perhaps aren't quite as wonderful as they appear to be, but there's probably some unforeseen issues that are going to rise as a result of that. Um, but uh, as long as the public has a desire for products to take the place of plastics, eventually we'll get there because that really is what's going to drive the market is demand um, right. and if there's not demand enough for a new product then there has to be demand enough uh, to make recycling uh, feasible and functional in as many places as possible 
Right. And there's so many problems with biodegradable plastics. People think if they, you know, throw a biodegradable plastic in their trash that then goes in the landfill that it will biodegrade. But really, that's that's not really the case. It's not going to biodegrade in a landfill. It has to be in a very specialized environment to actually biodegrade. And it does take quite some time. Um, just like I mentioned with recycling, I'm always talking about the misconceptions. There are a lot of misconceptions about biodegradable plastics too. And we really like to push that um, rather than biodegradable plastics, really working on recycling is what we need to do. And I was just gonna kind of add in a point if we have a moment is, you know, I think historically as a society, we have operated in a very reactive uh, mindset. You know, we've created a problem, now let's solve that problem and obviously you know, the recycling was kind of the birth of that. I mean, recycling came out of that mindset is let's right. solve that problem. But, you know, CARE in particular has uh, mentioned a lot of ideas for being proactive. Like what can we do differently on the front end so we don't have as many things perhaps to recycle. So if we, or, or don't have as much plastic to have to deal with. I mean, obviously mm -hmm. in my position, I'm seeing the trickle down effect of all of that. So, you know, the efforts that are being made now to uh, produce better products, to recycle more, um, it, it's going to take a time and, and in many cases, a lot of time to see the impacts of that in our actual environments. Because as I mentioned, from a microplastic standpoint, it, it's not an immediate breakdown. It does take months, years. Um, and so we could be dealing with this for long after our efforts are seen at the recycling level or at the way we handle our waste. Um, we're gonna still have to do some cleanup in our actual natural ecosystems. So. Thank you. I think that was a great question to end the panel on. It's very optimistic and still like real and just calling for action. And so I'd like to say thank you for all of our pan panelists. Thank you for taking the time and speaking to us and educating us and sharing your own perspectives and experiences. And um, for any attendees, just a reminder that the attendance verification will go out tomorrow. And last things, remember to reduce your consumption as much as possible because that's where that's where change really starts. And it's the easiest out of everything. You won't have to backtrack if you just start from the source. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I'm Tatiana. It's been great having you all. And I hope everyone has a great night. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.